all of us, inshallah, all together. All right. So next, we have Ustaza Shahida Sharif. I'm very excited to introduce Ustaza Shahida. She is a mother of two bright souls, a passionate educator, community cultivator. I love that phrase, a community cultivator and a servant leader. For over 20 years, she served in the Clara Muhammad Islamic School system in Miami, Oakland, and Atlanta as an Arabic and Islamic studies teacher, assistant, and curriculum consultant for professional development. For 20 years, over 20 years, mashallah. And say, Shahida, I, I am struggling to believe that you are old, that old. She attended the University of Miami studying psychobiology as well as the Abu Nur University in Damascus, Syria, mashallah, for a three-year intensive for Arabic language, Islamic sciences, and da'wah. That was not an easy program, nor were they comfortable seats. She has taught and offered religious guidance and inspiration around the U.S. and abroad in Central America, North Africa, South Africa, and the Middle East. Currently, she works as the communications director for the Atlanta Masjid of Al Islam and is the co founder owner of Professional Hajj and Umrah Guides LLC, organizing delegations annually for the Hajj to Mecca, as well as study abroad opportunities with her husband and business partner since 2003. She serves as president of Sisters United in Human Service. Inc. has traveled with and led an interfaith journey with world pilgrims of Atlanta to Arizona and Guatemala. Allah, I'm not done. As a certified doula, she assists and supports new moms as they deliver new life into this world. She loves reading, running, and drinking coffee or tea with friends in real life or over Zoom. I want to be your friend. <laughs> Thank you and welcome. We are really looking forward to you sharing with us your experience growing up in the War of Deen Muhammad, Mujaddid of this century uh, time. Alhamdulillah. Jazakallah khair, Anissa Tamra. Um, I, I'm grateful, alhamdulillah, to be here with you. And alhamdulillah, I remember going to some of your darses and kiamuleos in uh, Damascus, mashallah. So I am, this is a full circle. Um, and I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides my words and my heart and just to be able to share um, of Imam Warfi Muhammad and his life and the womb that birthed me, right? The womb that birthed him, the womb that birthed me and produced this thought and this thinking, um, alhamdulillah. Um, so I uh, begin with Audhu Billahi Min Shaitan Ar-Rajim, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, Wa Salatu Wa Salamu Ala Sayyidina Muhammad Wa La Alihi Wa Ashabihi Ajma'in. Alhamdulillah. Um, I will share my screen with you all. Um, inshallah, I believe it's uh, in the mode of presentation. <laughs> so uh, we have Imam Wafdi Muhammad Rahimahullah, who was the Muslim American leader for human salvation. And this is a, a, a term of endearment that was given to him from the community. And so as uh, Anissa said, you know, some refer to him as Mujaddid, some refer to him as a, a spiritual scholar, teacher, world leader, um, uh, philosopher, thinker, liberator, uh, so many different things. And it's, it's challenging to uh, uh, restrict or confine him to any one of those terms. Why? Because he was a master of so many sciences and uh, he was a revivalist in a way, as well as a, um, a liberator. Uh, so he, uh, while he was born within the unique circumstances of America and the time in which he grew up in, uh, with the upbringing of Al-Islam, he sought to assist those worldwide. So Alhamdulillah, um, this is where the leader for human salvation uh, came and was always shared on our weekly uh, newspapers, <laughs> the uh, Muslim Journal. So man means mind. A lot of the terminologies that I will be sharing um, is a lot of language that I grew up with. Um, and when we say man means mind, meaning that 
when we talk about man, when we talk about humanity, and we talk about the first human being that was born, it talks about the thinking man, right? And Imam Muhammad referred to this from Allah SWT Allah's reference in the Quran of that we were made as dhakirin with dhakirat, right? That we were to be thinking, we were to be conscious like Ibrahim alayhi salam. So this is the, um, the foundation for man means mind. And then we'll come to uh, woman means the womb of mind, right? Alhamdulillah. So we'll come to that. So inshallah, uh, and some resources that I will share uh, later, inshallah, we can share these slides where um, Imam Muhammad, he had an annual convention every Labor Day weekend. And um, one of the talks that I share is from 1994. I actually attended it um, on my own. I was 15 years old and my parents couldn't attend that year. And I literally got into a car, a family that was going from Miami, Florida. I said, I'm going to the convention. <laughs> I will not miss it. And um, they had competitions for youth. And I read the Muslim journal. I studied everything. I wanted to, uh, you know, shine, alhamdulillah. So he says, you are the best community brought out we have all for the benefit good of all people. And this was a reference he shared from the Quran, right? Kuntum khayru ummatan ukhraja linnas. And this is that Imam Muhammad, he took from this when he said, you are the best community brought out or evolved for the benefit or good of all people. Meaning that while he was situated to assist the African-American people, um, the uh, African-American Muslims, he was saying we should all have an, we should have an interest in all of humanity, mashallah. And so, in his early life, when we think about our early lives, we think about the womb that bore us, right? We think about that taqwa, that reverencing of the womb that bore us. And so, he always, whenever he would give his lectures or his um, public addresses, he would reference the womb that bore him. And so. While many have difference of opinion for the philosophical and, and uh, theoretical um, platform or political um, uh, uniqueness of the nation of Islam, this was the womb that produced him, right? And so his father, being the leader of the nation of Islam, the Hon you know, Honorable Elijah Muhammad, as he was uh, endearly uh, referred to, and Sister Clara Muhammad, his wife, um, they were taught about Islam in a very unique way, right? It was it was a very mystical man, a mysterious man that they called Fard Muhammad or Farad Muhammad, um, which you may have heard of. And he was of the Ahmadiyya movement, right? But he came to America and he saw the condition of the African-American people. And so he would teach uh, about Islam in this very unique way. Now, it wasn't Elijah Muhammad who went to him first, it was Clara of Muhammad. So Clara Muhammad heard his teachings and she went to um, these, these, these sessions and these lectures and she came home and told Elijah Poole at the time that we should you know, give our ear to this. And so eventually they did join the Nation of Islam and that was between 1930 to 1933 where those teachings were happening and the Nation of Islam was beginning. And this was the time around Imam Wafdi Muhammad being in the womb of Clara Muhammad, right? He was born in 1933. So even before he was born, W.D. Farad Muhammad named him. He was the seventh child of this family. And he actually wrote his name down, said it would be a boy and called him W.D. Farad. And so um, it's this is how the story goes where Imam Muhammad shares that he never knew what the D stood for. <laughs> and he asked his parents, what is the D? And his mother said, you know, only the uh, your father and, and, you know, Master Farad knows. So he went to his father and he asked him, he said, well, only he knew. And so for him, that struck him as a young child, right? That here it is, these leaders, these profound people <laughs> gave him such a mystical name they didn't even know the name of. So he, it, it kind of put in him a germinated seed of, I have to think for myself. And he renamed himself, right, with purpose. And so his name went from Wallace D. Fard to Warith Dean Muhammad, right? And as he was growing up, he was being trained by senior members of the community, women and men, pioneers in our community who were elders, who were learned um, in different subjects. And he also had private tutors. So the Honorable Elijah Muhammad would advertise in the local paper about having Arabic tutors. And so he actually had a professor, um, Dr. Uh, Diab, who taught him Arabic as well as other uh, Arabic native speakers. 
And so he was well versed in different sciences as well as um, Arabic grammar and things of that nature. And so he was also trained up until uh, his maybe 18, 19 into the University of Islam. So the University of Islam was the name that was given for the education from like kindergarten up until uh, university level. And people had graduate degrees <laughs> and everything, certifications. And this was actually a challenge to the public school system of homeschooling. So there wasn't really homeschooling going on. So Sister so Clara Muhammad was actually threatened with being arrested because it was considered negligent, right? Or uh, um, you were endangering your child's life by homeschooling. <laughs> so these were the, uh, the original, one of the original homeschoolers, alhamdulillah. And um, during the time when Elijah Muhammad was actually incarcerated for this, right? Um, for not going um, into the war for Vietnam, not um, enlisting in that way, but also for not educating the children in public school, Sister Clara Muhammad was the leader at that time. She would write to her husband and she would share what was going on, but she would conduct the business. So this is the womb that bore him. Um, and he actually considered himself uh, a mother leader. He, he, he coined it mother leadership or um leadership, right? And so this was how he led where the women in the community had positions, they shared in the work and they were very much, uh, when we think about the nation of Islam, in addition to there being um, men who were uh, captains and sergeants, there were women who were captains and sergeants and who taught the women um, the, I don't wanna say catechisms, but close to that, uh, the teachings of uh, the nation of Islam, right? And so uh, there were things that they had to learn and that they did. And so this mind was being formed around him, but because he was literally uh, being taught from the Quran, being taught Arabic um, directly from Arabic teachers, he had a different perspective, right? So as he grew older, he started to see the differences and distinctions between what his father was teaching and what Islam was actually um, sharing, right? And so during this time, when he uh, went, uh, he started teaching around the country and he was given um, positions as the minister, um, in the temples at what they were called at that time, he actually was uh, being heard, it was heard that he was teaching other than what his father was encouraging uh, the nation to teach. And so because of that, he was uh, put out. He was put out several times. And so, um, but his father still, of course, regarded him, that was his son, and kept him close. And so with that, uh, it's just important to understand that this wasn't something that just started in 1975, right? It was something that was inculcated within him that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, you know, placed upon his heart. And so, during the time of transition, when the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, he would prepare, you know, those who were in leadership around him to study, to increase their knowledge. He would never say this will be the successor after me, or because he didn't want to create that kind of atmosphere, but he would just encourage all of them to for that striving. And so when it came time uh, for the succession, he did name um, Imam Warfdi Muhammad. And so immediately after that, um, Imam Warfdi Muhammad started to share his teachings even more, right? And subhanAllah, he, he would use the Quran as his guide. So if you go back to lectures um, from 1970, 1974, 1975, you will hear his conversations with al Haj Malik Shabazz, with Malcolm X. You will hear his conversations with the community and how he was teaching them how to pray, right? And he would actually say from the Quran, he who created me will guide me, subhanAllah. And when we speak about, you know, the large conversion of Muslims uh, to Orthodox Islam that came through, um, Imam Muhammad, it was very intentional. Right. So there was a separation, you know, Farrakhan kept the nation of Islam and retained those teachings and he took on leadership and kept going. Um, where Imam Muhammad, he changed the names from temples to masjids, right? He changed the name from ministers to imams. He changed the, the actual setup in the temples, right? He took all the pews out or chairs out and we were having carpets, right? And so my parents, they came, uh, well, my dad was here. He was in New York from the time he was 13, but my parents are both from Central America. They're both from Panama. 
And um, they, when my dad was here, he was here from 13. So he always heard of it. Um, and when he came back from Vietnam, he joined the Nation of Islam. And then when he met my mom, he married and she joined the nation. And then when my grandmother came up from Panama to help my mom with raising us, she joined as well. And so my grandmother, mashallah, is still living. My dad is still living. My grandmother's 96 and she's still Muslim. Mashallah, going strong. And, you know, I'm just grateful to be able to tell their story, right? And so they were a part of this mass conversion in 75 and I was born in 77. And within my particular family, I was the first one born with a full name of uh, Arabic name, Shahida Ramadan Sharif, um, because they took, they bore witness to Islam. They took their Shahada, they called me Shahida. And it was during the month of Ramadan, um, SubhanAllah. And so this transition, um, he actually stopped using that phrase of, uh, of black Muslims to Bilalians, to connect us with the history, right? To Bilal ibn Rabah. Um, and so on some of my friend's birth certificates, it says Bilalian as race. <laughs> it doesn't say black, <laughs> it doesn't say African-American, it says Bilalian. And so many of us, you know, we would wear our pride of that name. And so um, if you think about it, what was going on within the context of America during the 60s, the 70s, it was very turbulent for the African-American community. So literally the nation of Islam was like an incubator a, a protective womb of sorts that uh, literally was an organization for financial independence, uh, for build, for removing that idea that African Americans were three fifths of a human, right, or a fifth of being human, right, whatever <laughs> it said, three fifths, and it, we didn't even. Uh, so we were raising children that didn't even have that as a seed germinating in their mind that we were less than, right. And so imagine around the country, you have groups of people who were adhering to the tenets of Islam, um, but were still not seen, right? They weren't seen by the world community of Muslims. And so Imam Muhammad, he saw this and he changed from being called Bilalians or calling ourselves Bilalians to the world community of Islam in the West, okay? So this was around 1977. So he addressed the Muslim World League when they had their first uh, Islamic conference here in North America but he also addressed the, the Christians, right? Because he, he knew his family, you know, many were Christian. Um, and he started what was considered CRAID, C-R-A-I-D, around 1977. And it was like a committee formed to remove all images of the divine, okay? And so he would go around, around the country and around the world talking about how this image of the divine portrayed of Isa alayhi salam, right? Or in the image of a white person, what that does to the psyche, right? And so when we go back to Farad Muhammad, he saw the psyche of the African-American people being uh, completely devalued and, 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 and broken down because, you know, they were being told they were less than, right? So I have to build you up. <laughs> so it was some psychological behavior reform going on in the midst of the spiritual teachings and the political, um, you know, movement, but literally what was happening in this transition um, from the world community of Islam in the West, and then eventually around 1980s, around 85, we became the uh, 86 American Muslim Society, right? And so what Imam Muhammad was intentional about doing was realigning the African American Muslim community with the American uh, society, right? That in the nation of Islam, we were rejecting the, the country that rejected us, <laughs> but now you can embrace them. You can be American, you can be Muslim, and you can live and conduct yourself in the society, raise your children without being violent, right? Without being um, uh, civil disobedient, you know, in that way. And so the main push was to own your citizenship, right? You are a citizen of this country. You have rights to it because we've been here from before <laughs> the first uh, ship came, right? People came from Egypt a long time ago, as they say, before the Mayflower. That's a good book to read. Um, or Sylvia Duyu. So I'm sure there's references and resources there for that. But it's just important for us to understand the context of the womb. So when we talk about this, I look at myself within this context as now I am over 40. <laughs> so I guess that's 20 years. I'm 43 years old. And 
alhamdulillah, I was literally being raised with my parents spiritually. So by the time I was seven, eight years old, we were learning Arabic from our teachers who were taught by Imam Wafdi Muhammad, who would do intensives with him every year um, in Ramadan and also, also other times of the year. And they would teach us the grammar, the breakdown, the different forms of the verb. Like we can go into the Quran at eight years old and literally break down ayats. Like, what does it mean? Who's being spoken to? Like grammar and morphology, right? And so this was unheard of <laughs> during the 1980, <laughs> the 1980s for African-American Muslims um, within our context, right? And also understanding that because we held on to our culture, uh, the way we dress, the way we uh, shared poetry and song, we would literally have, you know, conferences where people would take words from the Quran and make it into beautiful nasheeds, as we were listening to earlier, right? Um, and so that wasn't popular at the time. And so there was a lot of criticism, not only from the Nation of Islam, uh, community, but also from other African American Muslim communities and, and other Muslims worldwide, right? Because Imam Wati Muhammad was challenging not only how we were situated here in America, but how we viewed Islamic scholarship uh, within our context, right? And so, where there were uh, certain understandings for um, how are we to con conduct our lives, we couldn't conduct our lives as. I'm from Saudi Arabia, or as I'm from Pakistan, and I'm an African American Muslim living in America, right? And so it's just it was just a different, uh, ne necessary and essential movement uh, that he understood from a very early age. So coming to understanding that from 1975, he was about 42, 43 years old, right? So he was full adult. He had been living within this context, taught by the leader of the Nation of Islam and other leaders, and being able to see far down into the future as to what would be needed. And he knew it would take time. So over this period of time between 1975 and 2008, he was literally teaching the Quran, teaching the uh, example of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And even given all of the Islamic sciences, he just wasn't given the names like, oh, this is from this book or this is from that book. But he was given it within a framework and a context that could be received and it could be palatable uh, to us coming from our experiences, whether it was they were born Baptist, born Catholic, born whatever in America or the Americas, and then coming through the nation of Islam, there was a lot of undoctrinating, right? Even for many who are um, revert to Islam, there are still some things that you, we have to undo, right? We have to unteach ourselves in our uh, understanding of Tawheed or understanding of how we engage with society, right? If we are saying we are the best if Allah SWT is telling us that he, we are the best community evolved from mankind, what does that look like? Do we only serve the Muslims? <laughs> Do we only serve, serve African-Americans? Do we only serve women? So a lot of those isms, racism, feminism, all those isms were removed, right? And so I'm just giving the context for when we talk about words make people, right? And words build minds that everything that was given to us was intentional. So he would have weekly lectures on the radio broadcast that we were listening to, we would have the annual convention. And then from 2003, no, no, excuse me, 1999, he started with imams and leaders around the community, m women and men. He would have intensive Ramadan sessions where he would go through the Quran and go through different um, uh, texts and just teach. He would teach from like Fajr until Isha, subhanAllah. Of course, we would break for lunch, <laughs> but he would teach and teach and teach. And it was just beautiful to be able to be like at the foot of your teacher, right? Um, to be able to receive that. And, and so the blessing in that is that we were able to experience, right? Walk with him, witness him, hear him, take notes. And now, uh, I don't want to say we're in, we're still in an infant stage, but a lot of his uh, talks and lectures are being documented. Now, uh, books, I mean, excuse me, uh, uh, you can form more thought and understanding when you go back to maybe a lecture from 77 and compare it to the growth in 85 or to 94 or to 2008, right? Um, and if you are able to just look up shared freedom space, that was one of his last lectures before he returned to Allah SWT. 
and it's called Shared Freedom Space. Very beautiful um, lecture that was very encompassing of where we were. Um, so I'm going to go to the last slide and then uh, I just want to end with this. Uh, recently, I did a, um, a seminar with his widow, his um, uh, Khadija Muhammad Sadiq, who was married to the Imam. And she asked of us, uh, what do we understand of the language of Imam Mufti Muhammad? And I shared that his language is an evolving body of work and teach, his teachings are grounded in scriptural thinking guided by Allah SWT. Its essence is designed to liberate the human thinking from any influences other than God and offer a universal prescription that can benefit the world. That's how I have received him. And um, she also shared, and this was a, a paraphrase of her quote, she said, every community has a, rec a recitation of Quran, a reciter. And the language of Imam Muhammad is the recitation of a collective of souls of the African-American Muslim people. And so, like I said from the beginning, many people have different ways in which they reference him. Um, and some people even say he's a polymath in that <laughs> he's a master of many sciences. And he also sought to liberate the heart, the mind and spirit from any oppression, not just that of African-Americans, but any oppressed people around the world. And that could come in any form, right? Um, SubhanAllah. And one of these things that I have here, it says, what is your own self? It's a question. And the answer was my own self is a righteous Muslim. This was one of the, the lessons in the nation of Islam. So they had to have reform in how we identified ourselves. If I'm going to situate myself to receive these teachings, I have to acknowledge who I am and how do I regard myself. And so he would always you know, offer that dua that verily my life my my death, my work, and my sacrifices for Allah, Rabbil Alameen. And, um, you know, I just wanted to share that even my experience in going to Syria was his forethought in thinking because the Sheikh uh, Ahmed Kuftaro, who was the Grand Mufti of Syria at the time and over Abu Nur University, the director, he met with Elijah Muhammad in, uh, when he was on a lecture, a lecture circuit back in Detroit in the 60s. And he met with him for some time. And he said, my people aren't ready for you now, but they will be. And so uh, Imam Muhammad came to University of Miami and he spoke and he told me personally, he said, if you can go, I want you to go. Uh, and so I accepted that invitation. Like it was like a, a, it was not necessarily a question or a request. It was, this is what you need to do. And, um, and Alhamdulillah, as Anissa Tamra said, it was, very challenging, but he said, if I was there, I would be the best student and I would pass all my classes. He said, you go as if you're going into a prison, <laughs> like you don't even think about being comfortable. And so Alhamdulillah, we were able to go um, for five years with different groups of students. And um, now Alhamdulillah, they're uh, throughout the US and the Caribbean some, and some are teaching at Harvard, some are teaching in uh, Montessori schools and all over and running businesses and literally trying to implement uh, this framework of understanding, um, even how he approached the ascension, the night uh, journey that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi took and met each prophet along each level. That is a whole lesson even of itself, but he gives us principles from each um, meeting that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi encountered. So I just wanted to share um, a snippet. I know we don't have enough time to go into any more but I pray that Allah SWT uh, guides us to seek more knowledge of other communities and to join us and to come together with humility, with patience and support and love, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum. Ameen. Allahumma salli wa sallam barik ala Sayyidina Muhammad. That was incredibly enlightening and I have so many questions. So we'll have to, uh, we'll have to do questions on another day. But really, there, oh, there's your references. And also, I did find the, um, this is the shared freedom space. So I put the link now in the chat box. That's part one on YouTube. But if you go to part one, you'll be able to see part two. And I would just like to encourage everyone, not now because we have more speakers, but I would encourage you all to put that on the side because part of what we've just learned here has taught us we have a lot to learn. And it has taught us that there is someone that perhaps you haven't listened to before that you haven't heard his wisdom before, who has been extremely influential and extremely beneficial 
to our community here in the United States and therefore to the Muslim community throughout the world. So I'm really happy that we started with you, uh, Anse Shahida, and I'm really appreciative of you being here with us today and giving us your time. And I hope that everyone, also do you have places you want them to follow you, like Instagram, Twitter, things like that? Uh, you know, I have those things. <laughs> Um, it is it's just Shahida Sharif uh, on Instagram and Facebook. It's the same. All right. So you can find her on Instagram and Facebook, inshallah. Mm -hmm. And hajpros.com. And of course, yes. And if you want to go on Hajj Umrah, uh, go to her hajj, hajjpros.com and learn more. And we all pray that this will be a year that that can happen for all of us, inshallah. And if not this year, then inshallah the next year. I mean, all right. Well, thank you very much. And so now we move to our next topic and our next speaker. And our next speaker is Staza or Anse Carla Taylor. Very happy to have you with us today, Carla. She's originally from the Bay Area. Uh, and but now she lives in Southern California with her husband and three children. She holds a BS in health science and spent the majority of her professional career in the nonprofit healthcare field as program coordinator. And I can vouch for her uh, amazing nonprofit skills. She went in the healthcare field as program coordinator. She focused on grant writing, community outreach, and organizing events. She homeschools her children and is very passionate about creating valuable learning experiences with them. Notice the word with. In addition to teaching her children, she volunteers for various nonprofit organizations, including Rabata, where she is working also as a student toward her teaching certification and ijaza in Tajweed, mashallah. In her free time, she enjoys traveling, exploring the outdoors, and immersing herself in anything art related. MashaAllah, we're so happy to have you here to talk to us about Rosa Parks, and we look forward to learning from you. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for that introduction. <laughs> so um, I have to tell you that I'm really excited to, I uh, was really excited to work on this project and to talk to you all about the um, and very important person that's widely uh, regarded as uh, the pioneer of civil rights. So uh, the incomparable Rosa Parks, I'm going to share my screen with you all. Moment. Okay, so um, so many people are familiar with Rosa Parks um, for her for that famous day in Montgomery, Alabama, that when she um, was uh, stepped her foot on that bus and um, you know really stood up for for any uh, justice and and she was. Um, she really was an activist though, long before, uh, before that day. So I wanna really go over um, how she became known as the mother of the civil rights movement. So she was really shaped into an activist at a young age. She was um, raised during a time when there was a lot of racial discrimination and segregation and she um, you know, witnessed a lot of things that pained her and made her feel really um, just sad in her with the lynchings and Ku Klux Klan marching down her street. And she was raised in part by her grandparents who were former slaves and they were advocates for, um, for equality. So they really instilled how important it was to stand up for um, for justice and to not allow anyone to make you feel uh, less than equal. 
And they, they did this by really sharing black culture and the black history with her so that she was proud of who she was and where she came from. And through this, we're really able to see and appreciate how important it is that family and community, you know, really um, take the time to uh, nurture and shape the younger generation because it really does influence and um, have a great impact on the individuals that they soon become, that we all become. It's from our family and the environment that we were raised in. So throughout all her life, she's been involved in different community uh, committees and as well as different organizations um, from the Voters League to the women's rights, um, you know, protesting for um, equality in the education system, as well as um, being a member of the NAACP. But it's really through the uh, organization of the NAACP where she found her her stride in in her niche in her in her this activist role and she joined the NAACP in 1943 and at that time it wasn't what it is today it was really looked at as a radical group and um, it was you know looked down up, upon in the um, in the, in the white community, even a lot of uh, blacks in the black community were not too keen on it, but she really was inspired and, um, and, and stood behind everything that they represented and what they were trying to do to end uh, racial injustice. And she, she did a lot of work with them from being a secretary for the uh, president of the Montgomery, Alabama chapter um, but also investigating cases and interviewing um, many people who are involved in police brutality, discrimination, um, murder cases, rape cases. And uh, she, she just, she often said in her autobiography that the work was oftentimes depressing, but it was work that needed to be done and she didn't give up. Um, she remained very active even when she um, eventually left Montgomery and moved uh, and started a life in Detroit, she was still a part of the NAACP. So, so um, she, she while, while working, while doing work with the NAACP, she eventually um, was encouraged by some, some of the people that she was close with to attend a school in Tennessee called, called Highlander Folk School. And this was a school that was really geared toward um, creating a social change uh, within social justice. And she um, enrolled in a two week intensive workshop that was aided toward um, in social justice and, and trying to create um, social leaders within the community and, and within trying to uh, end segregation in the education system. So she actually um, attended this, this uh, workshop, not necessarily because she felt that she wanted to be this big leader, but really she, she wanted to learn the skills in order to teach the younger generation. She was really big on um, the importance of, of training the, the next generation to be leaders because although she was putting in all the work, she honestly didn't feel that she was going to see the change that she envisioned in her time, but she did feel that the change would could be made uh, in the younger generation by um, challenging the Jim Crow laws and and inequality. So she um, she so that's why she attended the the workshop. But the the thing was that towards the end or middle to end of of going there, her mind kind of her mindset shifted because the people who attended the workshop were from different backgrounds. And for the first time, she was actually um, inspired and able to really see what it looked like to be able to 
live in a uh, be in a harmonious setting where people of different backgrounds were able to you know have discussions and talk together and respect one another and before that that's something that she had always imagined but didn't quite believe that she would be able to witness so um so she she left there uh feeling very inspired um that was in the summer of 1955 so just six months later she stepped on the bus of um and stepped on the bus that would kind of create um history or not kind of but definitely create history and um and she she performed a courageous act that that changed the course of history really uh she's often depicted and and uh, discussed as this older woman, this older seamstress woman that just um, was getting on the bus and didn't really have any intentions of making a big fuss, and and she's not really um, and, and that her intention, her her actions were unintentional. But when she refused to give up her seat, she really was. She was. She definitely knew what she was doing. She was intentional in uh, in that action. And she was tired of the demeaning treatment that uh, her and, and, and Black people all around were, were being given. And so she made a choice to, um, and a huge risk to refuse giving up her seat. And at that time, um, bus drivers were actually um, allowed to arrest people. And they could really, she knew that going into the, you know, uh, by, by doing this, that she, um, she, the bus driver could do whatever he wanted and really not have any repercussions um, by, by police officers. But she, um, you know, she did get arrested and, you know, she, she and her husband both, they lost their jobs. They were uh, unemployable all throughout um, Alabama. And, uh, you know, they were getting constant daily death threats um, however, the NAACP really stood behind her and, um, and, and they backed her on, you know, supported her through, through uh, the arrest and, and just really um, the, the whole event sparked um, the start of the civil rights movement. having trouble going to the next slide. Oh, there we go. Um, so the um, right after the arrest, um, right after Rosa Parks arrest, then the the black community, they were they were outraged and they they also felt that they they wanted to stand up and and be part of this change. They they felt that they, you know, they wanted to do something more. And so she was really that that incident really sparked uh, and was the the catalyst of the Montgomery bus boycott. And uh, the Montgomery bus boycott was organized by uh, an organization called MIA, the Montgomery Improvement Association, who that was led by Martin Luther King Jr. And um, the reason uh, one of the the biggest things and what was so important about doing this uh, boycott was that the majority of the passengers of the of the customers in the bus system were African Americans. So by boycotting the buses, it was a huge financial hit for the the bus system, and it was a way to really. Um, let their voice be heard and to, to really open up people's eyes to, hey, we're not going to take this anymore. And Rosa Parks was, um, she was very large in, um, in the whole Montgomery bus boycott by uh, coordinating the uh, transportation system and getting boycotters to and from work. And this lasted for 13 months, which I feel is just it's such a long time when we think about protests today um, and doing something uh, for for like even a few months, just 13 months of 
you know, every day um, putting yourself uh, at uh, in, in danger, uh, putting your safety at risk, but they continued on until um, the US Supreme Court ruled that segregation on public buses was unco unconstitutional. Um, Rosa Parks is, is such a, a, a monumental figure in the black community for so many reasons. Um, she is, is what started the civil rights movement. Um, she what, did all the work prior to that by laying the foundation for, for people like um, Martin Luther King Jr. to uh, continue on in his, in his activist role and to, um, and to later um, uh, go, go on with the uh, Civil Rights Act of 1964. And she really did give uh, Black people in the community the, the courage to feel that they could speak up for themselves. They could, uh, they could challenge racial discrimination. They, um, they didn't just have to be silenced any longer. Um, she was sort of the face of that. And, and so she, she also paved the way for several numerous uh, or several activist um, groups and uh, activist uh, leaders to come. Outside of the outside of the black community, Rosa Parks was really influential in um, showing what an organized um, nonviolent approach looks like to creating change. Um, before that, we didn't really know, you know, there was there was groups, but to really bring a large group of people together and um, you know, she she really did create the blueprint for that um, through through sit-ins and marches and protests. We really do have her to thank for showing us what that even looks like and and what the um, and, and how big it can be and how how much uh, how much power um, people have when we come together. So how can we be Rosa Parks in 2021? Um, we, I feel like we first need to really educate ourselves, educate ourselves on the issues that are going on today. Um, there's, there's so many things that um, where, where change needs to uh, be made and, and there's, there's so much work that needs to be done, but we need to make sure that we're educated about these issues and uh, use the, the passion that we have inside of us to make that change, uh, use it to, uh, to, to, spark, um, to spark movements, to, to spark um, just uh, initiatives to, uh, to, really, to really change the way that, um, that the injustice is that we're living in today, um, today is. And we can also use that by, we can also do that by using uh, platforms such as like different social media platforms creating conversations, um, educating others, and, and really just um, uh, listening to each other and bouncing ideas off one another. Um, we need to also make sure that we're inspiring the next generation, uh, making sure that we are ex teaching them and guiding them on what it looks like to have their voice be heard, listening to their concerns, and and really um, nurturing them and and preparing them for the roles to be leaders in communities, and so so that that can have a trickle down effect across the globe. And um, and I feel like the biggest thing that we can do to be a Rosa Parks in 2021 is uh, commitment. Um, I I sometimes feel like commitment is lacking. Uh, nowadays, we're so we're so eager to see change happen so quickly, and we don't realize that we have to be patient and commit. And it's all the little things that add up to the big changes. And if we don't see it happen overnight, or you know, in a few months, we we can't become discouraged and just sort of throw our hands up. We need to to move on and um, and 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 not stop because even if where we don't see the change, the things that we're doing 
to make that change happen will be seen in generations to come, inshallah. So thank you. Allah, atikil al mashallah. That is, was, it was wonderful, first of all. Fantastic job. And secondly, really so important, you know, in Western schools, when we learn about Rosa Parks, we're taught that she's this little old lady who just happened to not want to get up and give up her seat that day. She was tired. And I love that you taught us today that she was intentional. She was an activist. She was making change. And I also love that you called on us to be the Rosa Parks of today. Thank you so much, Carla. And say, Carla, we really, I, I know I appreciate it. Somebody said something in the chat box about um, just a detail. So I thought I would just clarify that the, she, the buses, and maybe that's just an assumption that not, not everyone here is living in America. So maybe not everyone knows. But at the time, buses were divided. And so the front of the bus was designated for white people and the back of the bus was designated for black people. And she had sat in the first row of the back of the bus, okay? So what would happen is if more white people would get on, they would tell the, I was gonna say ask, but they would tell the those who were in the first row of the back of the bus to move. And that is what she refused to do. She refused to get up and leave her place. And so, yeah, she was intentional. And 13 months of walking, people would walk miles and miles to work just to not take the bus. So, all right. Thank you very, very much, uh, Carla, for, your, for that very informative and very well done talk. And next we have Ustaza Whitney Brown Abdullah. She is a visual arts educator for students in grades K to 12. She's also an ongoing student of the Islamic Arts and Sciences, studying for Ijazes at both Ribat Academic Institute and most recently, the Dean Arts Foundation for Islamic Calligraphy and Fine Arts, mashallah. She's most known for writing under the pen name of WB, I was gonna say WD, because of the earlier talk, but my tongue stopped, WB, Abdullah, for her spiritual travelogue themed blog, The Sandal, as well as her former book reviews and articles in magazines such as Aziza and Discover. Formerly trained in art education and international affairs, Whitney is also a homeschooling mom, working to complete graduate studies in social emotional learning and character development. She resides in the Washington DC metropolitan area and believes in the life-changing power of beautiful writing by word, pen, and art. And it's, that's not mentioned here, but she is also often a Rabota volunteer in different places, especially with our publishing press. All right, thank you, Whitney. And your her topic today is to talk to us about a very important historical figure as well, Taiba Taylor. Welcome, Whitney. Thank you so much. And say khair. I'm so excited to be here. Also very nervous, but I'm so happy and delighted to be able to honor Sister Taya Taylor um, and let you all know what I know about her. So I'm gonna share my screen. Let me see, I need to start that slideshow view. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Today I'm here to speak to you about Sister Tayyip Taylor. This is the last issue of Aziza magazine, if you've never seen it, which honored her. And this was her product, her main product that she is known for. During this um, presentation, I'm basically breaking it up into three parts. First, I will give you a description of Sister Tayyip. Uh, then I will give you a dream that I had. And then I will let you know what your duty is after you hear that dream. You will hear me weave together a couple of different stories because Sister Tayaba doesn't just stand on what people who knew her 
know about her, but through her magazine, you'll get to know who she was as a person. Through her product, you'll get to know who she is as a person. She also is very fond of alliteration. As you can see here, all of these words begin with a D. And if you were to pick up the Aziza magazine, you would see from time to time on the back cover or in the middle of the actual magazine, alliteration. And alliteration is you know, words that, sp that start all with the same sound, with all of the same beginnings. Okay, bismillah. I'm going to read this quote um, that is on the Rabata poster for Sister Tayyiba Taylor. These are her own words. Understand that your work and your worship can blend. If you are working with the intention of accomplishing something that reaches beyond yourself and into the world, then the work becomes this wonderful form of worship. Sister Tayyiba did not believe in separation um, of, of what we do religiously and what we do what we would consider mundane, everything, and, and as Muslims, we should know this, that everything that we do is a part of Ibadah with the right intentions. She was a woman of words. She was a woman of wisdom, a woman of wonder. She was a warrior. Those who know her know that she passed away from cancer. So she was a warrior um, fighting a, a health battle. Her publishing company was named WOW, and I think that says everything about her. We see the alliteration here with all of the letter W. My name begins with W, too. I'm just going to put that out there. <laughs> but um, she was someone who made you say WOW. And her main focus was unifying women through Tawheed, through all of our differences. We could be unified um, through our connection to Allah. My favorite hadith from Prophet Muhammad وسلم, is whoever of you sees an evil action, let him change it with his hand. And if he's not able to do so, then with his tongue. And if he is not able to do so, then with his heart. And that is the weakest form of faith. I believe Sister Tayyaba really realized this hadith. She saw that there was a need in the American Muslim community and she fulfilled that need. The need was that there was a lot of propaganda. You know, some, there's always someone who others Muslim women and wants to say something and put a narrative as to who we are and what we stand for. Aziza Magazine was the answer to saying, who we are ourselves for Muslim women to write and to actually own their own narrative. Um, this is the first day of Rajab. I do have to say that. Um, it's also Black History Month. We are two months away from Ramadan and it's a really special dedicated space to recalibrate. Um, Aziza Magazine and Sister Tayyiba's work were definitely about recalibration. She gave you many different viewpoints so that you could reflect on what you need to do. In this month of Rajab, Fighting is prohibited. And what's the opposite of fighting? It's love. It's, it's, it's giving love, giving kindness, um, you know, asking for forgiveness and being a beacon of love. It's all going to come together at the very end. The root of Rajab um, evokes meanings of respect and being in awe. I personally am in awe and, and, and in total respect of Sister Tayyiba even to this day. Um, but also I think that all the people that we have highlighted today are worthy of our respect and, and our awe. And I thought that that was a very nice, um, a nice parallel to the month that we're in and the people that we are speaking about. This month is a month of cleansing, of sowing, of preparation, of starting foundations. It's a month of winnowing, of sorting out the good from the bad. That is what Sister Tayyiba did. Instead of focusing on everything that was wrong in the media, especially with how Muslim women are portrayed as of how people of color are portrayed, she said, we're just going to celebrate what we can do through this magazine. And you can see a quote um, from her from the Aziza magazine, the last um, issue. It says, honor the creator by maximizing yourself to your fullest potential. That's what we're supposed to be doing here in Rajab. And Sister Taylor is telling us right there in that picture. These are some words that I brainstormed when I thought about Aziza magazine. It's a lot and I will try to break it down um, as quickly and as clearly as possible. The, the magazine image that you see on the left is the first magazine that I was published in, in Aziza magazine. I, was, I, I worked with her. Um, but as I, I flipped through the magazines yesterday, I just started pulling together words that I want to share with you about what this magazine meant. And as I talk about this magazine, I also want you to think about Sister Tayyiba because they're interchangeable in a way, okay? Aziza, if you don't know what that word means, it connotes meanings of strength and power and might and being precious, okay? So this magazine, I remember saving up for it um, and it would be like my treat. Some people love coffee or ice cream, but the actual magazine was my treat, my refuge from the world. It was glossy. I was, you know, 
I, I'm a convert and I'm someone who embraced Islam. And I, I'm used, when I became Muslim, it was frumpy clothes and, and a, a very, a very narrow minded view of how Islam should be lived for Muslim women, mostly given by men. So when I saw this magazine with women with beautiful hijabs and fashion spreads and it's glossy and it's shiny, I was like, whoa, this is a whole nother thing. And it also spotlighted women doing their work. So being doctors, being educators, it just spotlighted everyone who wanted to contribute you, um, there was a place at the table for everyone. So it was celebratory. It was interfaith. It was not didactic. It wasn't just about what the Sunni say, what the Shiites say, what the Sufis say. It was never, it was, if you have something to bring to the table and you're a Muslim woman, we welcome you. It was transformative. It was unapologetic. You could, in the magazine, you see so many different representations of Muslim women. It was empowering through that. It was widely read. At its height, there were about 80,000 um, subscriptions. So that's a lot of people. Um, it was unconditional um, and it was very fulfilling. It was an inclusive space. You would see people who are black, people who are Hispanic. The first magazine that I actually read that even let me know about Aziza, I'll put it here in front of me. Hopefully it won't. I think my background is not gonna let you see it. It was about indigenous Muslims. It was about indigenous Muslims. And I was like, whoa, I, did, I, I didn't know there were Native American Muslims before that. You know, it was, it was something new. Okay. As I mentioned, I did know Sister Tayyiba, so I will try my best to stay calm through this part. If you happen to meet Sister Tayyiba, these are the things that you would notice. She had a slight Caribbean accent. She was born in Trinidad, but she was Barbadian, as Bar Barbadian say. Most people say Barbadian, but if you talk to someone from Barbados, they would say Barbadian. She also smelled really, really good if you were able to get close enough to her. <laughs> she had class. She had grace, she had style, she was a wonderful speaker, she was dynamic, and she was a magnet. When She was one of those people who entered the room and you just naturally followed where she was going and wanted to be in her company. She was well-dressed. She reminds me of Imam Malik, of the Maliki school, um, of you know, honoring Allah by using your talents and dressing beautifully and showing that out of a, out of a source of gratitude. She was tall as well. She was a champion of diversity, equity, and inclusion. We spoke about that for a bit. She, you would notice health. Um, I knew her for the last four years of her life. I met her in 2010 and she passed away in 2014. She was born in um, 1952, I believe. And um, you would never know if she was sick or in pain unless she told you. She did not complain. At the very end, I did not know she was sick. I was actually very shocked to hear that she passed away. I had no idea she kept it from me. I, I did not know. And I feel like that's amazing. She worked through the very end and that's that's a that speaks to her Bedica. Um, she had care and tact for herself as well as others, not only in her dress, but in the way that she spoke to others. She would never rush you. Um, she spent time with you if you were to sit with her. She was a mother of five, so she really understood um, where women stand, where women stand in this world and how we're treated and, and all of the different balancing acts that we have to do and all the many different hats that we have to wear. She was full of ideas. She was a visionary and she was creative. She knew that I loved to read and my main part of the Aziza magazine was writing book reviews at that time. And she would send me books. What do you think about this? What do you think about this? Did you like this? And I was like, nah, that one was so dry. You know, you could just really say how you felt about something. Um, and she would feed your interest and find a place for you if you didn't know what your place was. Now I will tell you about a dream that I had. I have to be very honest and I have a little confession. When I was first asked to do this task, I really wanted to run away. I felt like I can't talk about Sister Tayeva. I, I feel like I'm still in grief actually. And that, that actually didn't, it didn't dawn on me until yesterday. It didn't actually dawn on me yesterday until that, that the word for how I feel is grief. Um, before I go into the dream, I'm going to share with you this poster. It's a poster that Sister Tayeva made. Um, and it talks about 13 things that we should leave to whoever follows us. Number one is commitment to Allah, it's taqwa, okay? Number two is you know, having a criteria, like really knowing your place, having a guideline. Number three is that unconditional love that I spoke to you about. Number four is being a critical thinker. Don't let anyone tell you who you are and what you can do. Number five is being charitable. Her magazine is a sadaqa jariya. Number six is, you know, your mental stamina, your mental health, taking care of that brain space so that you can do the work that you need to do. 
Number seven is basically honoring your heritage. Okay, so knowing your roots and honoring that, whatever they may be. And it doesn't have to be just ethnicity, but wherever you come from, wherever you're coming from, honor that. Number eight is self mastery, you know, knowing yourself and working on what your what's your strong suit and also improving those weaknesses. That's something, you know, to leave with us. Number nine is using the wings of knowledge of those who've come before us to uplift us and to keep us going. Number 10 is serenity, finding a space for peace. I mean, this, the past 12 months have been pretty heavy on most of us and we have to find a space for peace within ourselves and with our connection with Allah in order to do the work that we need to do. Number 11 is confidence. So maybe I was suffering a little bit from not being confident um, and you have to be confident in order to do the work that you need to do. Number 12 is an appreciation of beauty. The glossy magazine said it all. <laughs> she really understood how a layout should be and her dress, her fashion sense. It, she really understood what beauty is, but that's just a very baseline approach. Beauty is in words. It's in how we act. It's in our character. Number 13 is a sense of adventure. If you knew her, you might find out that she was rock climbing at like 50 years old and jumping out of helicopters and airplanes. She was adventurous, she was adventurous. And you have to have a little bit of time for fun in order to you know, build yourself up and do the work that you need to do. Okay, so now I will go into the dream now that we've discussed that. This dream occurred on Friday morning, this past Friday, like that was yesterday, yesterday. Um, it was after Fajr prayer, after the sun had gone back down, after the, after the, sun, after the sun rose. I went to sleep. Um, before this dream occurred, I had been fretting on what I was going to speak to you about today. I was like, I don't, I don't know where to go with this. I could ramble all day just because of my emotional state right now. Um, and I was searching for what should I tell people about Sister Tayyaba Taylor? What should my focus be? So I had this dream. In the dream, Sister Tayyaba was there. She was sitting on a chair and I was in an apartment. It was a space um, for Muslim women. Um, and it was just a Muslim women's face, which was what her magazine was about. So just think of everything I told you about as I narrate this dream to you. I went to the library of the apartment. It was on the very upper, the upper level of the apartment. And I was thumbing through every Aziza magazine that was ever created. Aziza magazine ran for 15 years. So I went through every magazine that was created in order to find things to tell you about Sister Tayyaba. Um, mind you, actually, um, as I was feeling nervous about this presentation, I could not find my Aziza magazines and I was getting quite upset and I was like, you cannot just rely on my memory alone. So I was thumbing through all the magazines and reading through and she was telling me things I don't remember right now, but I was taking notes. At a certain time, there was the Adhan for prayer um, and I saw all these different Muslim women running to prayer. One had a mini skirt on, one had black hair with uh, pink highlights and another had hijab on. I then woke up. I started reflecting and I was wondering why was this shown to me? And, 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 I, and I believe I know the complete meaning of my dream just through reflection. The three different women that were shown to me were the women that she, that she welcomed into her space. As I mentioned, it was a very open-minded magazine and it was a place where you did not feel judged. You know, you would see articles about many different things and you could not label it as progressive. You could not label it as liberal. You could not label it as conservative. It was just, these are Muslim women and these are our experiences. So in that way, it's very inclusive. And those were the women that were shown to me. The other uh, part of my reflection of this dream is that those three women were me. There was a part, I became Muslim when I was 16. So when I was 16, you can imagine most teenagers wearing a mini skirt, okay? I did have a time in my life where there was definitely dying of hair. We won't go into, we won't go into too much detail about that. And then there's me now with my hijab. And I feel like that was a part of my own growth. You know, I grew through Aziza magazine. So I wanted to share that with you because I think Sister Tayyaba would want me to share that with you. I had no other dreams of her in the past until yesterday. And now I'm doing this conversation today. So I felt like this was her message to everyone. We don't get to pick the family that we are a part of. We're all Muslim and we're all a part of this Muslim family. That being said, we need to accept each other as we are and remember where we came from. It's so easy once you become muhajabat or once you learn Quran or once you did this or got this degree to forget where you came from. We all have sins on us. There are different sins, but we all have sins on us.
Um, and we need to remember those places because those are places of growth where we can help shelter another sister as Auntie Terrence says, we in the shelter of each other where we can help bring up another sister remembering what our struggles were back then. Um, and I felt like that was something that I needed to share with you based on um, the dream coming yesterday. Um, it was talking about, you know, unification, we're all the same. We're, and they all prayed, all, all three women prayed, even though they were in different stages of their life and different stages of their Islam. And that's the meaning of Tawheed. Now that I've told you that dream, you have a task, you have a duty because dreams don't come just for the fun of it. The, the dreams like that mean something. You should claim your roots by watering them, whatever your roots are. It doesn't have to necessarily be that you're black or Hispanic or indigenous or Chinese. Maybe your root is that you have anxiety or your root is that you have depression or your root is that you come from this blended family or this dysfunctional family. Grow upon that and water it. Use it as a strength. Allah gave you the skin that you're in because it's a power. He gave you whatever he gave you, whatever difficulty he gave you, whatever adversity he gave you as a power. There's only so much that you can take from the earth without giving back. And I'm someone who gardens. You cannot take from the earth without giving something back. You have to water it. So make sure you water your roots. What Think about what you can pioneer. What can you do? We, we we so often find these places of complacency where it's like, what can I do? I have four kids, I have five kids, I have this, I have that. I There is something that you can do. You are alive because you have a purpose. Otherwise you would not be living. Sister Tayeba lived her purpose. She lived her life. That's why she's not here anymore. But even though she's not here, she's still working through us. The magazine still exists. And that's a Sadiqa Jariya. I had this dream yesterday and that is going to do something. And inshallah, motivate some of you to do the work that you need to do. So think about what you can do that someone else can continue holding, you know, that, like that Olympic flag or that Olympic fire when you're gone. What can someone else continue? What will you start? What's your passion? Think about what your passion is that will hopefully help you find your niche. Uphold the importance of women's spaces made for and by women. I am so blessed to be a part of the Rabata community because I started with Sister Teva, which had that women's community, and then I went into Tamra in 2012. Um, and that picture that you saw um, of Sister Teva and I, that was from 2012. Um, but they both have the same idea of a space for women by women. There's no one who can properly represent you um, except for yourself. Be a woman of words, be a woman of wisdom, be that wow when, woman that I talked about in the beginning. Be a warrior. Don't let whatever is holding you back hold you back. Let go and unleash the wow woman, okay? The only time that you can let someone tell you what to do or what to be or how to be is if it's a really good friend from really good company that knows that you've lost your place. Like Sister Tay reminded me that I had some things that I needed to discuss um, for the magazines. <laughs> and actually, there's another part of that dream, because I told you I couldn't find my magazines. I told you I, I thumbed through the magazines. Um, after I woke up from that dream, I went to my magazines and I found the magazine that I was looking for so that I could talk to you about. Make sure that you're open minded so that you can receive openings from Al Fatah. Don't forget where you've come because that where you've come from, because that can help your future. Do your due diligence. Do what you know needs to be done. Just like the hadith of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu that I told you about. Uh, if you see something that's not quite right, you need to winnow it. You need to uh, separate the good from the bad and do the work that needs to be done. Take care of yourself so that you can take care of others. And um, you'll see this beautiful, in, in, through this whole presentation, you'll see pictures from Aziza magazine. This, is, this, this image is basically what it was all about. Are you still wrapped up in the mainstream propaganda about Muslim women? Well, find out about Muslim women by Muslim women. And I feel like that was a, a wonderful image there. That was in the last uh, magazine. This is, a, this is a version of that alliteration that I spoke to you about in the beginning. In this one, it's informed, inspired, and illustrious. I hope that that's what I'm leaving you with today. Some more alliteration for you is to be wondrous, be willing and willful, be wise, be a woman. Being a woman is power. 
being a Muslim is power. Whatever Allah gave you, that is your power. Be you because you are beautiful in whatever you are. You have to catch the Aziza spirit and you have to wow the world. I have no doubt in my mind that the last ayahs of Surah Fajr are something that Sister Tayyiba realized. I believe deep down in my heart that um, she is of those who are spoken about in Surah Fajr who are welcomed into the company of Allah because she was well pleased with him. And if you actually read any of her writings from the very end, and I did go through all of my emails yesterday, <laughs> she was pleased with whatever he gave her and she did not complain about her health situation. At the very end of her emails to me, she would always write blessings or blessings and light. And that is what I would like to leave you with, blessings and light. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sister Tayyiba. Thank you so much for that, Whitney. MashaAllah, MashaAllah. SubhanAllah, I missed uh, a lot of her life because I was in Syria during the time that she was working on Aziza magazine, but I do remember it from before I left and I, I'm so sad that I didn't know her and that I, I didn't get that opportunity to know her better and to know her work better, SubhanAllah. But thank you for sharing it so that, so that I and the rest of us here can, can meet her in this way and as you just dreamt of her, uh, know that her work is still alive. That's what it means to leave a legacy. Alhamdulillah. And we leave shared legacies when we work, we all work together, leaving shared legacies over time. And it's been already amazing this, this noon to reflect on these important people in our history and learn about them and be inspired by them. And I'm very inspired by the lectures themselves and how they are phrased for us to grow through and from. So thank you very much. And we are going next to our lovely Ustaza Ruqayya Yaqub. And she is the founder of Light Legacy Books, which is a children's publishing company, a children's publishing house dedicated to telling the stories of little known heroes from across the globe. Ruqayya is an AMI certified Montessori elementary teacher and she studied Arabic and traditional Islamic sciences in the UK, Morocco, Spain, Mauritania, and the United States. She is a researcher, trainer, and author of the award-winning activity book, Ahmadou Bamba, Sage of Senegal, which we have here at the Rabata Bookstore in Minnesota. You can find it online at daybreak.rabata.org. <laughs> in 2020, she expanded Light Legacy Books into the delivery of online children's classes. And Estaz Ruqayya is also a very important and popular teacher here with Ribat, where she teaches us about all sorts of important modern and historical topic, topics that help to enlighten all of us. She's teaching an adult class right now about Nana Asma'u. And today, her topic is Nana Asma'u as well as Sheikha Maryam Nias. So thank you for being here. So happy to have you. Okay. Assalamu alaikum. MashaAllah, what an honor to be here, subhanAllah. So I used to live in Atlanta and I spent some time with Sister Taiba. And uh, I didn't know this was going to happen to me, but once Whitney started speaking, I actually started crying. <laughs> I was about to put my video off and I had to kind of like, I wanted to go upstairs and get some Kleenex, but I didn't want the kids to see me. So I stayed downstairs <laughs> and it was, it was very moving. So thank you so much. It's, SubhanAllah, may Allah increase the light in her grave and reward her for everything that she's done and all the people that she inspired. Because I remember back maybe 15 years ago, yeah, about 15 years ago, because I lived in Pittsburgh at the time, she had me do some writing for her. And I was like, I can't do anything. And she was like, no, no, go ahead. And I, so subhanAllah, may Allah, may Allah reward her. So yeah, after that, I don't know if I, I, it's hard for me to do the presentation now. So I'm trying to get myself back into like presentation mode, inshallah, I'm trying to make the transition. So let me just go ahead and get my screen up and then um, inshallah, uh, hopefully I can do it. Yes, inshallah. Okay, all right, Charlie, everyone can see that clearly. 
So I was told I had 10 minutes. So I really prepared a short presentation um, because I just wanted to really give an overview of two really, two, these are two giants really, when you think about them, um, what they did, um, the kind of lives they led and the service they did to the Quran and to women and just to society actually. And really the modeling of a really, uh, uh, modeling of what you can do when you embrace your, I guess I would say your maqam, your station as a woman, when you embrace the you know, the gifts that you have as somebody who is, you know, who is, you know, you have your own children, but also being a mother in society and being somebody who sees the importance of not just the education, because these people are people who really upheld education or very much involved in it, but also the idea of really um, bringing in healing into the community that they're in. And the stories, there's so much in common with the stories. I was actually thinking about either telling them in tandem or going one by one. So we'll see. I'm not just one at a time. Um, here I have a mushaf, which is actually, this is a, um, a West African mushaf. And I, I put it here because Sheikha Maryam, her, the, I guess the nickname that she had was the, the, the Khadim of the Quran. She was somebody who dedicated her life and subhanAllah, she actually had a Quran school. She established it in 1952 and she passed away last year. May Allah Ta'ala increase her and have mercy on her. So this is like 70 years of service to the Quran, you know? And they say during that time, tens of thousands of people memorized Quran at her hand. And that was just the actual teaching of Quran, but she also lived it and the people who are around her got that tarbiya from her that kind of training from her that, that quranic um, um training so um let's go into their lives inshallah i go down uh, so here i just have a picture now we don't know exactly what shaykh anana asma look like so this is just a representation but this is a photograph of shaykh maria yes and I'm going to go into my first slide, inshallah. So this picture, I love this picture because this is her as a child. And there's uh, this is her father. It was a great sheikh, Sheikh Ibrahim Nias. And he's somebody who, from the time that she was born, when the news came to him that she that she had been born, he was reading Quran. And he actually was reading Surah to Maryam. So when he asked about whether it was a boy or a girl, he was told it was, it was Maryam, he gave her that name. And he's, he, he decided himself that he was going to oversee directly her Quranic education. And he was somebody who actually was very committed to that for all of his children. And, now, and we know that this is something that they were all involved in studying, in, in memorizing Quran, in teaching. But her story is, is very unique, and inshallah, we're going to go into it. And so at the age of five, she starts studying with her father. And her father is a, is, you know, he's a man of da'wah. In addition to being a scholar, he's someone who traveled around the world, really working with people, Muslim and non-Muslim, to really help them understand how to be the best version of themselves and how to serve society. So he would actually take her on this, some of these trips. And, 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 though, and that exposure she had actually helps her later on in some of the things that she ends up doing in Senegal. But I chose this picture because she's, you know, young at this time. And when she's about five, this is when she starts to out with her father. He goes for Hajj. And before he goes, he entrusts her with a different teacher because these kind of journeys, they take a long time. And also you just, you know, don't know what the outcome is going to be. So she he assigns a different teacher to her and she carries on with her memorizing Quran. When, when he returns, he, you know, he's engaged in, you know, still training with her, but she's with this main Quran teacher. And mashallah, she benefits greatly from him. But when she was about, because she finished, finished memorizing Quran at about 15, this is what she says in her, in her, in her when she talks about her life. When she was about, I think, 13, she moves with her mother to a different um, city. And when she gets there, she wants to carry on with her Quran memorization. So her father sends a teacher. And then she's like, no, I don't want this teacher. I studied with him and he's not really suitable. <laughs> so he sends a different one. She's like, no, this is not good enough. So he, she actually ends up sending the, he, her original teacher. And he transfers his Quran school from Medina Bay, which is where the father is, is situated, to the home of her mother. And he actually runs to school there for the next like two, three years until his mother, her mother passes away. And then she ends up relocating to, to Dakar. She gets married and relocates. But just to show that she was very, she knew what she wanted and she was very focused and her father saw her dedication. So he actually, you know, had this sheikh move his Quran teacher, uh, sorry, his Quran school. Hold on a second, please. Turned off my camera. So I'm going to have to 
stop at this moment because I was working thinking I had Eastern time and my husband has a class he has to do right now and I'm in his spot. So I really apologize because I, I, you know, I thought we'd be done, in, uh, you know, but so I, I apologize. But awesome. there is a lot that you, if you can wait a few minutes, I can transfer over to a different place, but I do have to stop inshallah. So I think we will, we'll do a commercial. Okay. So I'm, I'm happy to have a commercial. You go ahead and transfer to another place and I will do a commercial break right now. In fact, I I have a real commercial for you, believe it or not. I have my lovely friend and and partner in crime here in Minnesota. Could we bring up Malika, please? Where are you, Malika? Malika, there she is. Okay, Malika, you didn't send me a bio, so I'm gonna swing it here. Uh, Malika is, okay, let me see how I do. So she lives here in Minnesota with me. I mean, not in the same house, we live in the same area. And Malika is the executive director of an organization here called Pearls of Islam, and she is also on our local committee for our Rabata local headquarters. And she does lots of work to help us grow Rabata here in Minnesota. She's also on the local leadership team, and she's originally from Toronto, but she was from in Memphis before. She sent me a picture of her with Laiva Taylor, so I'm super jealous. And mashallah, like Allah is just blessing her. Anyway, right before we went on today, she sent me a message and the beautiful heart that Manika has telling me that one of our lovely organizations here in Minnesota needed some help and it fit perfectly with our theme. So look at this, Manika. Allah has given you an opportunity for a commercial break. So please give us a commercial, a good one. But you're muted now, so please unmute yourself. <laughs> you don't know. How, there we go. How's that? You weren't. There you are. Assalamu alaikum, everybody. Alaikum, Sam. You're quite quiet, so if you could either raise your voice or we didn't do a check in with you with your stuff because this is a surprise for everyone. Can everybody hear me a little better now? Tiny bit. Shout. Right. Pretend you're in a classroom. I will pretend. I'll use my teacher voice. Jazakum Allah khair for having me. My name is Malaika Dahir, as uh, Sheikha Tamra mentioned, Ansi Tamra, Dr. Tamra, my personal shiro, alhamdulillah. Um, so as she mentioned this morning, um, I came to her quite distraught that um, an organization that's local here in the Minneapolis community that's serving um, a largely African-American and black community um, has not met their goal on launch good. And this is a trend that I sometimes notice. I'm not trying to be negative, but in my, you know, feeling down, I messaged um, ANSI and I was like, I'm just really disappointed that they haven't met their modest goal within hours. And of course, ANSI in her wisdom and generosity has offered me this platform to speak on them. So what I wanted to do today was talk about Al Ma'un. Um, it's an organization here led by Imam uh, Makaram Al Amin, who is a Bilalian actually, and a student of Warthin Muhammad. And um, I found myself uh, growing and nurturing my Islam through uh, Masjid al Mu'minun in Memphis um, and uh, Masjid al Nur here in Minneapolis and oh, a great part of my Islam um, and, and lots of great sisters. I see Medita over here, Letitia in, in, in Memphis. A large part of my Islam to the African-American community, including Tayyiba Taylor. So it is my passion to ensure that they receive the support that they need. So I come to you today asking you to follow in the footsteps of philanthropy and um, of Sister Tayyaba Taylor and those who come before us and support this organization. What do they do? They provide food. They went from serving um, 200 meals to serving almost 6,000 warm meals, all zabiha halal meat, by the way, okay? providing essential services, uh, food pantry, uh, PPA. And during the riots, I mean, the area just went from a food desert to, I can't even begin to tell you, without transportation to and from North Minneapolis, incredibly effective. So it became a lifeline. So you can imagine Muslims serving the greater community. Allahu Akbar. So what I wanna do today is uh, please invite you to contribute the Muslims, Bilalians, doing the great work here in our lovely Twin Cities from wherever you may be. They do have a launch good. Um, the launch good is 
If you send it to us, Marika, we'll get it in the chat box. All right. Um, it's uh, almaroon.org backslash donate. And I'll put the launch good um, in the chat group as well. Thank you guys so much for having me. Thank you, Anse. I love you. Um, whenever I'm in the dumps, it's just a quick message and, and I'm back to myself. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. I really, really appreciate it. Oh, we love you, and we're so glad you came on to do this. And I, we have a couple of questions in the box. I think some, a few people might have come on late, so I'm going to go ahead. I don't see Ruqayya yet, so I'm just going to take this opportunity to fill in. Oh, there she is. She's back. I'm going to fill in anyway, just real quick. Um, so we did have a presentation earlier. In fact, our first presentation today was about Worth Dean Muhammad. It was fantastic, so I really recommend that you watch that earlier. But basically, uh, when... Malika is saying that he's a Balali, and it means that he is linked with uh, Warathi Muhammad in the black American community that grew out of the Nation of Islam in 1975. Not enough details there at all, but it's a wonderful community here in Minnesota, and truly they do. They uh, Three or four years ago, they, they had like 50,000 tons of food that they were giving out to the community, and that's before it became the, uh, the food desert the post, I mean, the, before it became the, the area ravaged by the whole post George Floyd, um, I don't know what to call them, stuff that has been happening in Minneapolis. So, alhamdulillah. And we're so happy to have you back, Sazar Uqayya. It was just perfect timing. I did a little commercial. So, all is well. You're just muted. That's the only problem we have now. <laughs> Uh, there you go. Allah, thank you so much, Ansi, and thank you everyone as well. Um, yes, he told me, and I forgot. He told me what time he had to be on, and I, Mashallah, I wasn't prepared. So, alhamdulillah. No thank worries you. at all. And Malika got that. It's from Allah. It's from Allah. Allah wanted us to hear about this community that needs some extra money, that needs, and you know, it's not even for the organizations, just so they can feed the people. So, in this day when we are talking about Black History Month, we should be supporting black communities so yay it was a good opportunity so please go right ahead all right so let me get back to my screen okay this is here all right all right so i was talking about the, the um the sheikh this is as, as a young girl and just showing her just the example of her determination and a desire to you know to learn the quran to memorize it and not just study I mean, although that's very important to memorize Quran, I'm sorry, I think the light feels a bit, a bit too much. Okay, sorry, not just to, you know, memorize um, Quran, but also, although that is extremely important, but also understanding some of the meanings. And some of, one of the reasons why they say it took her so long to memorize, because she was about 15 when she finished, is that she wasn't just memorizing Quran, she actually was studying the sciences of the deen. And, this, and she was somebody who spent most of her life in Senegal, yet she's fluent in Arabic, she, she, she writes, she lectures, and she can she can teach all she Rahim Allah, she could teach all sorts of um aspects many of the sciences of the dean so she spent part of her youth studying those things so she was studying them as lot as well as memorizing quran and she also was a woman of of a spirituality and it's something that she was dedicated to now she when after she she got married she was about i think 15 at the time 14 or 15 at the time, no, sorry 15 or 16 um yeah. it's just what you know in, in that time she was born in 1932 so things were that's how most women around that time that's when they got married she is in her husband's home and one of the first things she does is um establishing uh start, starting to teach the children in the family quran and then people hear about it they want to send their children to her and then before you know it, she has a school this is how she established a school when she was you know barely you know in her late teens early 20s she establishes her school and she has because of her mastering of the quran when she would teach them it was she she had a mashallah she had a, she had the skill to not only help them with memorizing but they would memorize quite quickly and this this kind of spread so people more and more people would send their children and alhamdulillah it, it, it was established and because like i said she would travel with her father when he would go on certain trips like dawa trips or for hajj there was one tour that he took and this was he was actually gone for about two years 
he went he, he goes to you know he makes the hajj he travels to egypt travels to west africa he meets them because he's the kind of person that he isn't just interfacing with muslims he's meeting with different leaders like the the uh the president of the inaugural president of uh ghana Nkrumah, you know other you know leaders during the you know the 60s and the 70s and she is meeting them too and and those connections that she makes because they're seeing her seeing a woman who's memorized quran a young lady who's who's very dedicated to study later on when she ends up needing to expand her school and you know needs um financial uh financial. actually she doesn't necessarily ask for it but this is something that they offer to do because they, they because they know her they know her of her of her of her love for the quran her service to the quran they they support her and the work that she's doing so she's able to not only get a place because she's from all this time she's teaching quran in her home this is where she her home is the dara that's the the, the center of study she's actually able to establish not just one school, but a number of schools when numerous people memorize Quran. They say the number is about 10,000. It might be more than that, but the thing is that those are just the people who study directly with her, but many of those people establish their own Quran schools. So think of all of that Salah Qajariya that she's put out there because of those people she taught, and they, they taught people, and, and she, they, it's generations, because this is something that started in the 50s, through the 60s, through the 70s, through the 80s, and 90s, to the present day. So mashallah, may Allah, may Allah reward her and increase her. There was one other little story I was going to mention, and this is when she's on a trip with her father, and they're in um, Arabia, uh, in Saudi Arabia, and she, her father, they, she goes to the Muslim World League. This is they're supposed to touch, her father's supposed to have a meeting with some of the um, the um, some 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 of the individuals there, and she it comes later on. And when she tries to enter, they tell her she can't. That she's a woman, she can't enter. And she says to the guy who's stopping her, that aren't you ashamed of yourself? Like I'm trying to go in and you know and be of benefit, and you have your king who's just got back from a trip to the UK, meeting with the Queen of England, <laughs> you know, and then I'm a Muslim woman trying to you know access this area, you're telling me that you can't. And she's still, you know, she's pretty young at this time, but she feels very confident, understanding what her deed is, what her role is, that she's able to give this you know correct this man this man then you know he apologizes he lets her in and i think and i think about you know lessons in people's lives is that really understanding when to be firm and understanding when to really and, and actually also knowing what your what you what you would do as a muslim but the kind of respect that you do the access that you that, that you should be able to have so when people try to deny that to you you're able to you know correct them and help them understand that this is really not the way to behave as you know as a as a, a Muslim man to a Muslim woman, um, so I think let me go down a bit because I have some more. So here, okay, so here, this is almost like a summary of her of her life. Um, so I mentioned here that she was involved in conflict resolution. In this situation, this is this is a situation. It was it happened two times. It was between um, Senegal and the Sudan, and Senegal and um, Iran, where they actually reached out to her. And reached out to her because of her reputation, because she was known to the international community. And that's one of the things that differentiated her from many of her sisters and many contemporary women who were scholars, is that because she did have that access, she did have that network from the travels that she had, and because of the school and uh, the, the the her um, she became well known when she did into you know when she entered those kind of areas she was listened to and her advice was sought um and then i mentioned the school i meant it was, i made a mistake here it's 1952 that's when it was established and 10,000 is we don't know exactly the number we know it's in its 10 there are at least 10,000 or in its 10,000s that's how many Quran graduates that she has had so I'm going to talk about Sheikh Nana Asma as well and then I was going to talk about lessons from both of their lives inshallah all right so this is a whole different century one in 1793 passes away in 1864 and same thing she starts at a young a young age and one thing i want to mention about both of them is that they both grew up in scholarly families this is something that she saw the idea of scholarship was just very common in the family that she grew up with and this is something that i'm sure i'm going to draw attention to later the importance of us bringing our families along with this so you not necessarily have to be forcing them but kind of creating the environment where everyone feels that this is part of our family culture each family has you know has to have its own culture of what it stands for what it's what it's about and when the people in the family know that this is what what's important to us this is what's important to, to the mother to the father to the children it's something that's it's easier for a person to take that on 
And it might not be that everyone in that family becomes scholars, but you've sown those seeds to the next generation. It's just normal. Just like how some families have a certain meal at a certain time, you know, certain time of the year, or they have certain, you know, clothes that they wear. This becomes part of the culture. And this is something you notice in the um, Sheikh, Sheikh Ibrahim Niyas's family. This was part of the culture. And this was part of Sheikh Anan Asma'ul's culture that she inherited. And when you do that, it just makes it so much easier for the child. You don't, you don't have to kind of like start from the beginning. They're building on each generation that came before. So she's also deeply spiritual and she lives in a time of civil strife and that's when you read her work it's it sounds really like it's it's pretty firm it's not it's not as you know you come to you think oh okay, a woman's writing is going to be very flowery and, and lots of uh you know it's 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 there's a lot of like very um firm strong language being used because this is the kind of environment that she's in where the you, you, for many years, the family is actually on the move. They're engaged in battle. They're trying to protect themselves and protect the the fledging community. And it's reflected in the work that she 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 um, produces. And it's also a lesson for us because sometimes we're not going to be in the ideal situation where you're able to really have the you know the leisure or the security to do the things you want to do. But you can we can still establish something and this is something that you see in her life that at some point yes things are set, settled but still she has responsibilities but in her earlier years there is a lot of movement there is a lot of um there is a there's threats of attack and yet she carries on with her responsibilities she memorized quran she studied the sciences i mean if, if you read her books it reflects her knowledge her knowledge of you know what scholars before had written her knowledge of the great men and women of the past of their story of their life and their lessons her knowledge of um, the purification of the heart and the importance of the science and she interweaves it into the work that she does and in the, and the work that she produces because like i mentioned here she produced she, at least 61 of her works and no one have been translated who knows how many more are out there because we haven't really documented the writings of her or many women around the globe really and you go to any society you can't tell me there isn't a place where islam has been where there aren't women who wrote just because they aren't in the libraries or the bookstores isn't the proof that they didn't do this. So we know that wherever Islam goes, because of what Islam stands for, you have women who, who, who want to express that, even if it's just for themselves or letters to other people or something they share with their children or with their students. And in the case of Sheikh Anana Asma'o, she had students. So because of that, and what you notice, even with male scholars, the ones who become very famous are the ones who have students, because the students are the ones that really spread, you know, what was known. And there's a particular poem that her father wrote, um, um, which is a, a poem on, you know, Islam in Man and I really do write some responsibilities of the, the community. And it was, she he wrote this in Arabic. She translates it into Hausa, and it's, it's actually, of all his work, is the most well known because she put it into the langu language of the masses. So just to backtrack a little bit, um, this is, an, I'm talking about an area in Northern Nigeria that covered other countries as well, but the primary area was Northern Nigeria. And the main language spoken there was Hausa, although there are other languages like Fulani or Fufude, which is her language. So she speaks those, a number of languages, she speaks four, at least four languages, but she knows that the average person speaks Hausa. And, and even though they can read Arabic and they can, write, they can read Quran, they're not gonna have that same understanding of work when it's in Arabic. You know, so she wants to put it into the language that people are thinking in, they're dreaming in, they're speaking in, so that when they hear these words, because the way poetry worked at that time is, and also to this day, it's very musical. When you hear it, it sounds like song, you know, and it's a conveying emotion, it's conveying history, it's conveying culture, it's conveying, you know, important lessons. So she takes this work, knowing how important this work is, and puts it into Hausa. And this is what becomes, this is how this the knowledge in that particular piece that her father wrote becomes well known. And in addition to doing that, she also wrote her own original pieces. She wrote a number of books about different things. And um, one last thing I was going to mention about her is, um, actually the number of things, maybe I'll mention three more things, is she was somebody who was involved politically too. Even though she wasn't a quote unquote political leader, but she was somebody whose advice was sought when it was time to choose the caliph. When it, because of her wisdom, because of the respect they had for her, but also because they knew that she understood the vision of the community and she was one of the people who preserved that. So they would come to her. And when she saw people who were doing, like, for example, there was a governor whose actions were in alignment with the, with the 
with the vision of the of her father and it was established in the the, the the kingdom she she wrote about it she wasn't like oh this is my you know cousin or family my kinsman i would just let it pass she would speak out and she's somebody who used the influence that she had she used the the um the abilities that she had to um to bring to bring around to, to correct when needed to educate when needed to bring healing when needed and people would come to her because they knew that she would help them in you know whether it's to do with problems in the home whether it's to do with illnesses or you know whatever it is she was somebody who her, her brother said about her she soothed all all uh, all hurt you know any kind of ailment or hurt person had if they were around her she would give them ease and 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 one of the things i was going to mention going back to sheikha and mariam is she had her own birth children but she had a number of children that she ended up fostering and there was a story of where she saw this little child who was begging and you know and not far from her home and she asked the, you know the child and she's like well my parents you know set me up because I, I don't have any money so she goes and meets with the parents and asks them if she can foster the child so this child ends up you know living in her home she provides for the child she you know and and this wasn't just her this child there was a number of them not just from her city but also during her travels there's one story about when she went she traveled she went with her baby at the time who was about two months old she comes back with all these children and they come part of her household and she would provide for them give them you know new clothes to eat when it's time to marry help them with getting married and getting established she was somebody who saw herself as a mother not just to her own children but to society and she was very very um she embraced that and she saw it as a high station and something that we one of the lessons that we get from this is that you know and i think many of us know this martial even the society doesn't always recognize it that it is a really important role it's something that it's there's indeed a lot of blessing and it's difficult obviously it's difficult but everything in life is difficult you, you know the reality is things are difficult and but when you embrace it and you decide that this is going to be like a spiritual path for you in addition to whatever other path you have you end up getting the blessings of that the, 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 all those things that you do in addition to causing so much benefit to those around you so let me see oh yeah so um before i was going to go into the door i was going to say that with, with when, when i look at the, the lives of these women you see women who are very firm about, they weren't shy to disagree. They weren't shy to be um, very vocal about how they understood things and what, what their opinions were and how they felt things should be. And they were respected for that. And, you know, and even, and, and people, would, people would pay attention. And we have to realize that it's, we can be, you know, because you think about it from, in some lenses, they might be described as conservative or whatever it is, but they were very comfortable in who they are, who they were, in the gifts that they've been given, in the role they had to play, and they and they and they and they went after that. You know, even if it meant having to correct a person, whether it's a political ruler or a guard at the entrance of a of a building they were committed to study and to teaching and with Sheikha, Sheikha Rukai, um, Sheikha Maryam, we know that numerous people memorized quran with her and we know that numerous people benefited from Sheikha Nana Asma because of the education system that she established so not only did she teach in her home to boys and girls to men and to women but she also taught women in the outlying areas who didn't have as much access and she had a whole system that you know there are many books i've written about this that you can you know become familiar with but there's this i'll tell you a little bit you know it's referred to as yantaro and it referred to these women who would come to her they would bring gifts to her she would then give those gifts out in charity to help the society around her they would study with her and there's certain books that she wrote to promise that she wrote specifically for these teachers because they would those teachers then would unpack it when they when they when they went back to their hamlets to their villages and they were interacting with the women who couldn't make that journey and that way men, women around the the kingdom which spanned a number of countries like i said going all the way through you know chad Cameroon, modern day Cameroon, modern day Chad, modern day northern Nigeria, uh, modern day Niger, parts of Burkina Faso, probably the top parts of Bene and Togo, you know, that whole area, you had women having access to learning, which was important because so in some situations, the community, didn't, the, the men in the community didn't see the importance of them studying. In some situations, they just didn't, they didn't have the access because some of, some of these people were just coming into Islam 
with the case of Shekhan and Asma'u. So she had to start with really basic ideas for some people. For others, it was different. They already had some grounding and it was a case of really raising them even higher. But inshallah, I'm gonna stop because I know it's been a long, it's been a lot, but may Allah Ta'ala connect us to the spiritual legacy, intellectual legacy, and social impact legacy of these giants. May Allah Ta'ala reward them and increase their rank and continue and, and, and continued benefit. I mean, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad, Allahumma salli alayhi wa sallam. Ameen, Ameen. Allahumma salli wa sallam barik alayh. Thank you for that incredible conversation, that incredible talk. I, I've been a big fan of Nana Asma'u for many years. Uh, I didn't, and I'm always happy to hear more about her, learn more about her. Sheikha Maryam Nyase is somebody who is new in my repertoire of women I'm learning about. And again, I'm sorry that I didn't meet her while she was alive. SubhanAllah, it's... Um, I have to, I want to, I need to go and travel and meet everybody. I want to meet everybody. <laughs> Inshallah. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Thank you all very much for all of this. We are moving next now to beautiful.